In this video, we'll be looking at dihybrid inheritance, where uh, we can look at the inheritance pattern of two different genes. So in a previous video, I talked about monogenic inheritance, where it's showing one single gene. And actually, that is something that you would have also come across at GCSE level. But uh, for dihybrid, actually, it works exactly the same way, except this time in the Punnett square, it is a bit bigger because we need to show different types of allele combinations or gametes that are formed. That's why, uh, because it's now we're looking at two genes rather than a single gene. So uh, the classic example that you will always look at will be Mendel's experiment where he was crossing different types of peas. Now, uh, when he was uh, looking at the different peas, he noticed some uh, two particular traits. So there will be peas of different colors. So they can either be yellow or green. Uh, and also um, they could either be uh, having a round shape or a wrinkled shape. And uh, without actually realizing what was going on, and he did some crosses, and now we know, because of his experiment, that the yellow allele uh, is actually dominant over the green allele. So that's why we have the capital Y to show the yellow dominant trait, and green and smaller to Y for the uh, recessive green trait. And also round is dominant over wrinkled, so that's why capital R for round, smaller to R for wrinkled. So if we look at F0, the parent generation, so where we are doing a homozygous cross, you will get big Y, big Y, big R, big R, and small for all of the other ones for the other parent. So you get yellow round and green wrinkled. Now keep in mind, this is where most people got a little bit confused. In monogenic inheritance, you would show that each gamete will only have one letter in them, or a letter with a superscript as the allele. But in this case, when it's dihybrid, we, can, we must show that each gamete will be carrying at, at one allele of both of these genes, because now you're showing two genes rather than just one gene. So you, would, you will most definitely have two different letters in them this time. And it's possible to have four different genotypes depending on the uh, the original phenotype or the original genotype of the parent. So in this case, uh, I could have a combination of the first Y and the first R. So that's why I would get big Y, big R. Or I could have the second, second Y with the first R, or perhaps second Y with the second R, or the first Y with the second R. So that's why I can get four different uh, types. But however, in this case, you would see, no matter what the combination, the first one, the second one, or whatever, I would still get the dominant allele for both of them. So in this case, even though I can make four different types of um, gametes, they all four gametes would have exactly the same genotype, which will be this. So all of my uh, gametes would show just this trait, but because uh, for the sake of being clear, I still have to show all of the possible combinations. On the other hand, it's exactly the same uh, for the other parent, but this time because all of the alleles are recessive, so again, it doesn't matter which particular combination that I might get, I still get the recessive for all of them. So this will be what it is. So as you can see, uh, I'm also always drawing the rings around it to show that these are my individual gametes. Now because this time, uh, in order to show the different expected, uh, expected ratios of the genotypes of the offspring, um, I need a much bigger uh, Punnett square because I've now I've got almost double the uh, number of gametes compared to the original one. So this is what it will look like. So this is my Punnett square. As you can see, I've got the four possible gametes of one of the parents there and the other four possible gametes of the other parent there. Again, you can't be lazy uh, by not drawing the rings. You must draw them because you will, number one, definitely lose marks. And actually, scientifically speaking, if you don't draw the rings, you're showing the genotype, the actually the end genotype of a single individual. Whereas this is actually not an individual's um, uh, genotype, but it's actually a gamete genotype. So you must make sure that you're clear. And after that, actually, it's exactly the same as the normal Punnett squares that you see. So for this one, for this gamete to... Uh, fuse with this gamete, I will get big Y, small Y, and then big R, and small R. And then if I do the same for all of them, it would look something like this. So that would be my results. And as you can see here, which is rather obvious, that all of the offsprings here, uh, you will get are basically uh, heterozygous. So you get a mix of big R, small uh, big R, small R, and big Y, small Y. And uh, another quick note is that you will notice that we're always putting the capital letter in the front. Uh, although, although it doesn't make any 
technically speaking, any scientific difference. It's just a common practice to put the dominant allele in front of the recessive allele. But as you can see here, it's 100% um, heterozygous. Now, what we could also do is to take any two of the uh, offsprings, uh, in this case, the heterozygous, and do a heterozygous cross. And then obviously uh, the ratio would, uh, would change again. So we'll look at that one next. So if it's a heterozygous cross, uh, so this is my next generation and I was crossing two of the offsprings, um, so you can see here uh, that would be the case. Now, this time, if I am drawing out the different gametes, they would look very different to the ones before, because the ones before you would see that uh, I've got the homozygous one, so it doesn't matter what the combination would be. But now, the combination would, um, would be slightly different, so we have to be much more careful with what we're writing. I'm going to uh, use this one as an example, but obviously you should expect that the four possible uh, gametes formed by this parent will be exactly the same as they have the same genotype. So here I would start, let's say I've got the first Y and the first R together, so I've got the big Y and big R. And then drawing the ring around them to show that it is a gamete. Then let's say I do the second Y with the first R, so I've got the small Y and the big R. Again, drawing the ring to show a different gamete. Then let's say I do the um, first Y with the second R. So now I've got the big Y and the small R. Then lastly, I've got the second Y and the second R. Then I've got the small Y and the small R, like so. So for this particular parent, and actually it's the same for the other parent, these are the four types of um, gametes that they would produce. And as you can see, this time it is rather different from the first time because they are all actually all four different gametes, whereas the first one for each parent, they actually made exactly the same type of gametes. So I'm gonna transfer this information into my Punnett square and then do a cross again. Now, as you can see, this is my Punnett square. And like I was saying before, because both of the parents have exactly the same genotype, then the four different types of gametes that they make would be the same as well. So let's do a few as an example. So here, let's say this gamete fused with this gamete, and they will get both of uh, they will get both the dominant um, allele for Y, and then also both of the dominant R, like so. And on this side, on the other hand, they would get um, the one of each, so big Y and uh, big Y and small Y, and then both of the big Rs. Then for this one, if it's this gamete without gamete, then it will big y, be big Y, big Y, and then big R, small R. Whereas for this one, it would be big Y, small Y, and big R, small R. Now if I do the same for the rest of them, then it will look something like this. Now as you can see, just from the looks of it, um, they would produce many different types of offspring with various different types of uh, genotype. Now what's important is now be very careful and make sure you know what the letters actually mean and to find out what the phenotypes uh, or the expected ratios or of the genotype and the phenotype would be. So now obviously uh, for this particular type here, we'll be looking at the phenotype because it's more straightforward that way. Then you can see big Y, big Y would mean that it is showing the dominant trait, which is yellow, and big R, big R showing the um, dominant trait for the shape as well, so that's round. So this one would be yellow and round. For the next one, big Y, small Y, again, because the small Y is recessive, it will be yellow, once more, and big R, big R, dominant for both, so again, round. And actually, if you look through, this one would be exactly the same. Yellow and round for all of them, just based on the first one here. If we do the second one as well, uh, uh, you can see that it will be slightly different already. So for this one, big Y, small Y, it would be yellow because it's showing the dominant trait. Big R, big R to show the dominant trait of the round one as well. But this time we've got small y, small y, so you would see it would be slightly different. So this time it would be uh, green rather than yellow. It's still round though, however. And it's exactly the same sort of here, situation here, so that's again, it's heterozygous actually for both of them, so it would be yellow and round. And for this one, small y, small y, so it would be green and round. And if I do the same for the rest of them, it will become something like this. 
And for the other two rows, you can see yellow round, yellow round, yellow wrinkled, and yellow wrinkled, yellow round, green round, yellow wrinkled, and then green wrinkled. Now what I will do next is to actually count out uh, the total number of different types of phenotype um, and then basically find a ratio or number in the 16 possible outcomes here. So for yellow round, if we have to be very careful in counting this, it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So we get 9 yellow round. For yellow wrinkled, again being very careful here, uh, I would get yellow wrinkled in here, 1, 2, 3. So we get 3 of them. For green round, I would see 1 there, 2, and then 3. And then green wrinkled, there is only 1 at the very end. So actually, as we said, there are 16 possible combinations and actually doing some very quick maths, there are your 16 possible combinations. So as you can see, the ratio is 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. And that is our expected ratio from a heterozygous cross uh, in, in a dihybrid um, inheritance. This is a ratio that is worth remembering as well. So same for the monogenic inheritance where I say, okay, remember it's 100% for homozygous cross, actually for both monogenic and dihybrid. And also remember that it's one to two to one if it's a heterozygous cross for monogenic. And here for a dihybrid heterozygous cross is nine to three to three to one. And this might become useful, especially when it comes to chi-squared uh, test calculations, where you have to compare the expected ratio to the uh, actual ratio or observed ratio and to see if there is any difference between them. And that would be the heterozygous cross um, in a dihybrid uh, cross for dihybrid inheritance. Be prepared that they may throw different types of uh, genotype combination for the parents. So here I'm just showing a heterozygous cross, but they might give you a heterozygous parent here and then give you a completely um, homozygous recessive parent on the other hand. So just be prepared. Uh, as long as you're very careful and check for your work every single time, I'll throw out this one and it should be fine. So I mentioned earlier that there could be unexpected ratio sometimes, and there are some, these are the two possible reasons. The first reason is remember that fertilization is random by nature. So when you never know which egg cell is going to be released in that particular situation or which sperm cell is going to actually make it to the egg cell and fertilize it and it's completely and utterly random um, in, in that sense. So you can literally have different combinations whatsoever. So you can only try and predict the possible combinations of alleles but then be prepared that in reality it might not be the same. And the other, uh, another reason is what we call autosomal linkage. Autosomal linkage refers to a uh, linkage where two genes are found on the same chromosome. So before uh, we mentioned about sex linkage, and actually that is almost like an example of autosomal linkage, except that sex linkage is specific. We're talking about genes that are found on the sex chromosome, whereas autosomal linkage can be found literally, or talk about any other chromosome in the genome. And sometimes we can have autosomal linkage, and that would mean that the genes here are inherited as a package, so they're stuck together. Uh, but sometimes that could change uh, depending on if crossing over can actually occur. So it relies on if there is autosomal linkage and if there's crossing over occurring, which separates these two genes into two completely different areas. And we can also see that, for example, let's say for this chromosome, the genes are very close together. And if they're very close together, that means crossing over is less likely to occur because it has to occur in this tiny space in between them. Whereas these two genes on this chromosome are much further apart. So this is more, these two genes are much more likely to be separated by crossing over. So it depends entirely on which one's the case. And in order, a classic question is that you have to do uh, what we called a statistical test to see uh, if the um, observed ratio is the same or different or significantly different to the expected ratio. And uh, we use what we call the chi-square test to do this. And this particular part, remember we mentioned the word significant 
difference. And this is majorly important, again, because we're talking about that it's significant means that there is an external factor affecting it, or indeed this case would be linkage or epistasis when we're saying that genes are interacting with one another. So if we find that the chi-squared value is bigger than the critical value, then yes, there is linkage uh, occurring, making the observed ratio becoming different to our expected ratio. But if the chi-square value is smaller than the critical value, then okay, there's no significant difference, meaning that we have uh, correctly predicted or the of the actual ratio of the offspring is as expected as what we would have originally predicted using the punt square. So as a conclusion, very quickly about dihybrid inheritance, uh, it is something to show the inheritance patterns of two different genes rather than a single gene, and that's why the Punnett square would be much bigger and the gametes would be a little bit more complicated than your monogenic inheritance. Classic example would be about peas uh, in, in the experiment done by Mendel. Um, uh, you can have yellow and green peas determined by the, um, the color gene, or they can be round or wrinkled depending. Uh, decided by the shape gene. So you can have uh, big Y for yellow, small Y for green, big R for round, small R for wrinkled. And let's say in a homozygous cross, you will get 100% of them being heterozygous, meaning all of them would have big Y, small Y, big R, small R, and they would show the dominant traits in both of these genes to show yellow and round. But if we are crossing two heterozygous ones, so, and obviously the gametes will be a little bit more complicated, but again, it's, it's straightforward as long as you're very careful with your work and you will get an expected ratio of nine to three to three to one. Nine being yellow and round, three being yellow and wrinkled, three being green and round, and one being green and wrinkled. So sometimes be very careful, this is the expected ratio. So we're talking about percentages or a proportion of the offspring. Uh, they're not absolute numbers. So let's say in a situation, if the question is asking you to calculate the number of um, yellow wrinkled peas in a, a thousand peas offspring, then obviously you make sure you do a thousand times three over 16 as the ratio to find the actual number for yellow wrinkled peas. And again, make sure your roundings are correct because you can't have half of a pea. So make sure you're rounded either up or down depending on the number that you get. And then we mentioned how that was only our expected ratio if none of the following occurs. So keeping in mind that we could get something slightly different if because it's a random fertilization process. And the fact that sometimes these genes, let's say the, uh, the color and the shape gene, they might be possibly linked together. And that's why it sometimes, or perhaps crossing over may or may not have occurred. And that could cause a difference in the, um, in the actual outcome of the ratios. Uh, in order to see if there is actually a significant difference between the expected and observed ratios, we would do the chi-square test in order to uh, check that. And that would be dihybrid inheritance.